Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and begin. I'll just give some introduction, um, assuming that my collaborators are still here. Montana Taco. My name is Joey Lovstrand. I'm a, a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in linguistics at SOAS, University of London. It's my first year there. And I think so far, these series of webinars has been the highlight of the year. It's been great to see so many people interested in tuning in and various topics in uh, linguistics. Uh, this, our guest this time, um, I'm particularly excited to welcome in part because uh, I spent some time in Indonesia in the last few years. And Yanti was somebody who welcomed me and hosted me in her venue at the University of Atmajaya in Jakarta at least four or five times. At some point, I lost count of how many times I went to events that she and her team and her research unit, PKBV, are organizing there. So it's great to be able to switch roles and get to be host for uh, Yanti this time. Um, I met Asako uh, when they uh, presented this work that's in progress at a conference in Jakarta back in February. Uh, so it's great to get a sneak peek at uh, what they're working on then. I'm glad to uh, get, that more people have a chance to see what their ongoing work is all about. They're looking at uh, variation in Indonesian. And when I first started getting a little bit interested in learning about Indonesian, very run into this question right away of are you going to learn formal Indonesian or the colloquial street Indonesian uh, presented as sort of a basic uh, diglossic division between these two kinds of language. But as you get a bit more into the country and culture, you realize that there's much more than just two ways to speak Indonesian. It's all kinds of regional variation. And there's a lot of anecdotes about uh, variation. And there's been some studies of certain uh, regions like Papua and Malay or other types of Indonesian. But there's very little out there in terms of data that actually compares the way people speak Indonesian across the country. And so Yati and Asako's work really uh, is perhaps one of the first of its kind to provide uh, a somewhat comprehensive look at comparable data that goes beyond anecdotes or just lists of words and looks at really what is the variation, how people actually use the language when they speak, uh, how they're changing, what's influencing that. Um, and so it's an interesting work both for their methodology but also for their results and looking forward to hearing their reflections on some of the implications of their work as well as how it relates to people's different uh, regional identities and how they view themselves and why they speak they do. So I'll try to unmute our speakers. Before uh, I give them the floor, let me just say that uh, yeah, Yanti and Asako will speak for 30 or 40 minutes, and then whatever is remaining of our time in that hour, we'll open it up to questions. Um, because we're a fairly large group, we'll probably just do questions in writing. So if you have a question at any time, you can uh, just type that question into the chat. And then at the end of the time, I'll go through and try to ask as many of your questions as possible to Yanti and Asako. So, terima kasih. Thank you very much, Yanti and Asako. Looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Sama sama. So, hello everyone. Depending on where you are, good morning, good good afternoon, or even good evening to you all. First of all, Asako and I would like to thank. So as at University of London and especially to Joy Lofstrand for inviting us to share our ongoing work uh, at this webinar series. Today we are going to present about regional variation in Indonesia as already mentioned by Joy. So maybe I should start sharing my file. Maybe I just turn off the video so that it's quite clear. Wait. No. Is it clear? Uh, can you see the slides already? Uh, okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Um, according to Ethnolog, there are about 710 living languages in Indonesia. This is about 10% of the world languages and makes Indonesia the second most linguistically diverse country after Papua New Guinea. And these languages, fall into two language families. About 65% of them are Austronesian, 
whereas the 26 percent belong to the non-Austronesian group or they usually call refer it to as Papuan languages. The linguistic diversity is more obvious in the eastern part of Indonesia, especially in the provinces of Papua, West Papua, Maluku, and East Nusa Tenggara. This is a map of Indonesia. The country is located in Southeast Asian, uh, Asia, and the area ranges from here to here, part of here. And the linguistic diversity is observed mostly here around this area in Nusa Tenggara Timur, Maluku, Papua Barat, and uh, Papua. Papua Barat or West Papua. In the 1945, when the country declared its independence, Bahasa Indonesia or the Indonesian language was promoted as the national language. Actually, most, almost two decades before, in 1928, the name Bahasa Indonesia was first used when it was declared as the language of national unity by the nationalists. Bahasa Indonesia is Malay, or a variety of Malay, although at that time, there were only about 5% of the population understood the language. And the linguistic area of Malay covers Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Singapore, and South Thailand. Returning to its role as the national language, Indonesian is used as the main medium of instruction at schools, the official language in the government offices and mass media. Because of this role, more and more younger people learn Indonesian as their first language. Studies have shown that there is a weakening of local languages. However, the Indonesian language has been in contact with local ind indigenous languages, regional lingua francas, and foreign languages. While there is a decline of indigenous language, languages, the language contact has triggered the emergence of new varieties, especially in larger cities. These varieties inherit the features of indigenous languages. And in this talk, we will show the, sh the sociolinguistic situation in Indonesia with a sp special focus on regional varieties of Indonesia or Malay. We specifically focus on describing the linguistic features observed in the urban varieties we mentioned earlier and discuss how people's identities are reflected in the use of these varieties. What we are presenting today is based on the data in a semi parallel corpus we have been building using a picture task. We will also discuss this briefly later. Let me now provide a picture of the classification of Malay based on Adelar 2018. Um, according to him, Malay varieties can be categorized into three uh, types, standard varieties, vernacular varieties, and regional lingua franca varieties. The standard varieties include the official Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Malaysia in Malaysia. The vernacular varieties um, are spoken in traditional Malay regions, such as Pontianak Malay or Brunei Malay, which are spoken in the island of Borneo. Regional lingua franca varieties are spoken mainly in and around urban areas, or originally the speakers who speak different, uh, uh, used by people who have different mother tongue. In our recent work, we claim that actually the regional lang lingua franca varieties um, based on the, uh, like based on the present states, we can categorize the regional lingua franca in, uh, into two more groups and they are established varieties and emerging varieties. In this slide, we'll show the sociolinguistic hierarchy of uh, Malay uh, Indonesian. The standard Indonesian is more prestigious, 
as it is used as the standard language, the Bahasa Baku. As the standard variety has spread through education and mass media, most people are now bilingual or uh, of more of uh, more of two uh, more than two uh, varieties. And then the uh, vernacular varieties and regional lingua francas are considered less prestigious. They are often referred to as Bahasa Sahari Hari, the language of daily life. So that's an overview of the social linguistic situation of uh, Indonesian. Now, let me continue with show, uh, by show, uh, talking about the method and um, data of our work. We have been building a semi parallel corpus of Malay Indonesian varieties. The corpus consists of narratives elicited using the Jekyll and Crow picture test as a stimulus. We follow Carol et al. 2011 work. The picture test consists of nine pictures depicting scenes from the story of Jekyll and Crow using non-stimulus, non-linguistic stimulus for eliciting data has been adopted in many recent studies. The use of such stimulus helps elicit utterances under specific conditions to clarify specific linguistic aspects, which is rather difficult to clarify either through the non-controlled utterance or other elicited, elicitation methods such as translation to a medium language or asking for grammatical judgments. The pair story project and the frog story project are examples of other studies using non-linguistic stimulus. These are the nine pictures of Jekyll and Crow tasks. The first picture shows the crow, a, like a crow takes a fish from a basket. Then a jackal comes and see the crow fly to a, to a tree. The jackal, the jackal uh, imagine how delicious the fish is and salivates. Then the jackal tells the crow to sing. Then the crow starts singing and drops the fish. The jackal eats the fish. He is uh, satisfied and licks the lips. And then um, the crow looks really sad for losing his fish. So that's the, the pictures that we, we, use, we use. Now, how did we collect the data? So basically, we asked the participants to tell a story based on the cards. For each participant, we follow the following procedures. First, we gave them the cards one at a time. Then we asked them to tell a story by looking at the picture one by one. After that, we ask them to tell the story without looking at the pictures. So we, we already have two, um, two types of stories there. And in some, sec in some sessions, we also ask the participants to tell the story from the view point of one of the characters, either the jackal or the crow. Okay, now let me try to briefly talk about the nature of the data we have. The task is predominantly designed to collect narratives. So the features observable in interactions, of course, rarely appear in the data. Thus, the data may miss some distinctive re regional features that would be observable in conversations. The nature of the task also has a disadvantage in that it induces speakers to choose a more formal or standard variety, which is easily associated with recounting narratives, especially in locations such as in Jakarta and Makassar, where the regional varieties are considered colloquial or informal versions of standard Indonesian. Despite its limitation, this corpus has allowed us to make direct lexical and structural comparison among the varieties. 
and to see distinct regional features in some cases. The clearest structural differences are observed in transitive um, clauses. We will focus on the, um, the points in the following. Before that, let me show you the locations where we have collected our data. There are 14 locations in Malaysia and Indonesia. The data were collected collaboratively by some researchers who were involved in the ILCAA, the Research Institute for Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, that's Asako's institution. So it's um, joint research and um, with a project title Research on Malayic Varieties. We really thank our collaborators and all language, language consultants for their contributions. Um, okay, now let me move to the next slide to show some samples from our data. We will use the data we collected in Jakarta as a representative of standard Indonesian. And we will, as for the vernacular Malay, we will show the data from Brunei, Malay. And the um, Kupang Malay is shown to represent the established regional lingua franca variety. And then after that, Asako will focus on talking about emerging variety in the uh, second half of this presentation. We have observed various kinds of distinctions among these varieties in phonology, morphology, and lexicon. Um, and in this presentation, we will only focus on morphosyntactic distinctions that are observed in predicates with verbs. Let us introduce one very basic point about verbal morphology in standard Indonesian. Maybe many of the audience already are familiar with this, but just to make sure that people have the same idea. Standard Malay is characterized by the nasal prefix meng to mark the active voice, as we can see in example one. Uh, the mum prefix mark the active voice. And the D prefix is used to mark the passive voice, as shown in example number two, dibaca, that um, prefix by D. Now, what about the data we have in our corpus? I will start with Jakarta, Indonesia, as I mentioned earlier. So let me try. Okay. Let, let's listen to the recording. Pada suatu hari ada ekor burung sedang uh, mengambil ikan di tempayan. Lalu dia terbang kembali ke pohonnya untuk menikmatikan tersebut. Tak jauh dari pohon itu ada seekor anjing memperhatikan burung tersebut dan melihat ada ikan di paruhnya. Okay. okay. Um, as we can uh, hear in the recording and also in the text we present in this slide, there are four transitive verbs used by this uh, speaker in this uh, excerpt. Mengambil, uh, ambil, with the meng prefix, and then menikmati with the meng uh, prefix also, and then memperhatikan also with the meng prefix, and melihat with the meng prefix. So they are all, they all occur in uh, meng prefix verbs, and almost all the speakers of standard Indonesian take similar strategy. So we can see that Hmong active verbs are the unmarked transitive construction in narratives in standard Indonesian. Now, what about in uh, Malay, Brunei Malay, which is a representative of um, vernacular Malay? Let's listen to this first. Uh, di sering hutan ada sekong gagak kalaparan 
Tarabang punya Tarabang berjumpa uh, lauk uh, lauk dalam bayung diampiri lauk ini di rungkupnya sekong di bawahnya Tarabang sampai ke kasaba sepuhun kayu hinggap ke di sana. Okay, so as we can see here. The speaker uses three passive verbs in his story. Diampiri, dirungkupnya, and dibawanya. So in this particular variety, it seems like the D passive verbs are the default, uh, uh, are the default in the narratives. Next, we will see the uh, regional lingua franca variety. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is a representative of the established lingua franca that is Kupang Malay. Let's listen to this. Ada burung gagak satu dia picuri ikan di pinggir laut di sana ada ikan dalam bakul ini 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 burung gagak hitam ini dia picuri dia pi toto ameni ikan juga dia terbang terbang pi atas pohon satu di atas ini pohon. Okay, so. so as you can see um, also uh, in the text here the word churi to steal and churi also toto they are all um, in bare forms but they are follow, uh, preceded by the word p which is a truncated form of um, Pergi or pergi to go. Well, so we have seen interesting differences of marking verbs in narratives in these three different varieties of Malay Indonesian. That's in standard Indonesian, vernacular varieties, and um, the established regional lingua franca. How do the data from emerging varieties look like? Now, Asako will continue the presentation. Okay, please, Asako. Yep, thank you. I will continue. Uh, now, we will talk about emerging urban varieties. Next. Yep. New urban varieties have been emerging after the spread of Indonesian as a national language. The status of the variety sometimes may not be sufficiently established as an independent one, and reflecting the status, its speakers often recognize it as a colloquial or informal version of standard Indonesian rather than a dialect. Only a little research has been done to investigate the linguistic features of these varieties except Jakarta colloquial Indonesian, spoken in the capital city of Indonesia. Jakarta colloquial Indonesian is a variety emerged after Indonesian independence. Colloquial Jakarta Indonesian is not the same as, although has been influenced by Jakarta or Butawi Malay, which was traditionally used in this area. Outsiders call it Bahasa Jakarta, but the speakers themselves just call it Bahasa Suhalihali, daily language, considering it as one of the registers of, of Indonesian they use. For outsiders, though, it is a prestigious dialect and often serves as an informal counterpart of the former variety and thus has been influential to other regional varieties. So let's listen to an example from our corpus. Jadi pada suatu hari ada seekor gagak yang lagi cari makan. Nah, pas dia lagi nyari makan itu, dia nemu ada sebuah kayak tempat besar gitu, kayak tong begitu isinya tuh ikan. Nah, si gagaknya tuh milih untuk ngambil satu ekor ikan. Nah, pas Yeah, here the speaker uses five transitive verbs 
chari, nyari, namu, midi, ngambil. Four of them occur with nasalization of the stem initial sound. That is nyari, namu, midi, ngambil. The nasalization is considered to be a reduced form of the active voice prefix mun in standard Indonesian. So we could say that this variety, Jakarta Colloquial Indonesian, is similar to standard Indonesian in that the actor voice form is an unmarked choice in narrative, though the morphology is a bit simplified. Next, let's move to Makassar. Uh, we will see the variety relatively recently emerged in Makassar in Sulawesi in eastern Indonesia. Makassar is located in the eastern part of Indonesia, far from Jakarta, and considered to be in peripheral region, rather peripheral region in Indonesia. Makassar is the capital of the South Sulawesi province. It is a large city with approximately 1.77 million of inhabitants in 2017. It is a multi-ethnic city. Makassar is the most dominant ethnic group and other major ethnic groups of South Sulawesi, such as Buginese, Toraja, Mandar, form the majority group. People from other ethnic groups, such as Javanese, are increasing recently, though. Gil and Jukes deal with Makassar Indonesian, or South Sulawesi Indonesian, as regional variety of Indonesian. According to Gil, Makassar Indonesian functions as a lingua franca for communication between speakers of different ethnic groups mostly Makassar and Bugis. Jukes showed some grammatical features of the variety from his observation. However, detailed linguistic features based on corpus have not been examined yet. From our corpus, we could see about Makassar Indonesian these points. First, Makassar Indonesian shows features shared with lingua franca variety, other lingua franca variety, for example, frequent use of P, that is a reduced form of go in predicates. And second, it also shows heavy influence of Makassarese, a predominant indigenous language in the region. The most striking influence is the borrowing of pronominal critics from Makassarese. We will show a brief outline of Makassari's predicate structure based on Duke's 2013. The Makassari's predicate has a structure like this. Before stem, aspect or modal procritic and or ergative critic pronoun occurs in this order. And after the stem, aspect or modal enclitic and or absolutive critic pronoun occurs in this order. This table shows the critic pronouns and TAM critics in Makassarese. Critic pronouns are marked with orange and Makassar Indonesian borrowed the critic pronouns with some adjustments, the details of which we will not discuss any further in this presentation. And as for TAM critics, that is marked with green. Uh, among them, the three M critics, that is Mo and Pa and Ja, form combinations with enclitic ergative pronouns. Next. This table shows the combinatory forms. Among the 20 combinatory forms, Makassar Indonesian only borrowed the third person TAM critics 
which is marked with yellow. That is me, perfective, P, imperfective, and G, limitative. And Makassar Indonesian uses them for all the persons. So now let's listen to the example from the corpus. Uh, ada tadi burung, burung ambil gitu ikan kak. Ada ikan tiga bakul di situ. Nah lihat tuh, ngambil nah, satu itu ikan kak. Baru namakan ki, uh, nah bawa ki pergi di anua, di pohon kak. Uh, ada. Iya. Yeah. This text is provided by a speaker whose first language is Makassarese. This in this short excerpt. We have five transitive verbs, ambilki, nalia, na ambilmi, na makanki, na bawaki. And four of them have proclitic pronouns marked with green, and three of them have enclitic pronouns marked with blue. And the TAM marker marked with orange me occurs once in the Verb phrase na ambil me. Next. So we can say the predicate in the excerpt in the previous slide take the unmarked Makassari transitive clause structure with some adjustment proclitic and bear stem and enclitic. Namakanki means he ate it. Let's see another example of Makassar Indonesian. Ada tuh cerita ini eh, burung gagak dia mau pi cari makan. Nah dia datang mi eh, dia ambil mi dia ambil mi ikan di dalam bak. Terus toh itu eh, dia sementara dia bawa mi tuh ikan. Ternyata ada serigala yang lihat-lihat iki dari jauh. Nah, nah itu serigala datang mi pi bertanya di burung gagak. Gagak eh, menyanyi kok dule. Terus eh. the speaker of this text is a native speaker of Bugenese this time. Here the speaker uses TAM markers mi which is marked with orange more frequently than the previous speaker. Although she also uses enclitic pronouns marked with blue twice, dia lihat ki munyaniko. So next, next slide, please. Yep. Now let's have some discussion on Makassar Indonesian. If we see the situation of Makassar Indonesian from a view of linguistic or grammatical borrowings in general, bound morphology is highly resident to borrowing, according to Prince 1988, among others, among others. Borrowing of pronominal critics observed in Makassar Indonesian is therefore cross-linguistically an uncommon case. And most speakers of Makassar Indonesian all fluently speak standard Indonesian too. And standard Indonesian has its own device for person marking. Thus, person marking with Makassari set of pronominal critics in Makassar Indonesian is redundant from the point of view of expressing propositional pro meanings. So how a question arises, arises how should we explain the use of pronominal critics of Makassari's origin in Makassar Indonesian? One hypothesis may be that the speaker used the pronominal critics to demonstrate their identity. The speaker's comments will support the hypothesis. Uh, this is a comment from a Makassar young guy 
Uh, he is a speaker of the first example of Makassar Indonesia. When we requested him to tell a story in Makassar Indonesia, he asked us like this, which level do you want? According to him, there are two levels of Makassar Indonesia. Level one is the lighter level. It only employs the TAM critics such as me, he, and Z. And level two is the heavier level. It employs pronominal critics. He added, outsiders use only level one. Level two is only used among the indigenous people of South Sulawesi. Let us introduce a comment from another consultant who is a Bukinese graduate student studying in a Japanese university. He said, most of the people of South Sulawesi origin understand Makassar Indonesian of level two that it's the heavier level, but non-Makassarites, for example, Bugenese, only use the level one, that is the lighter level among them. They use the level two only when they speak with Makassarite people. He also said, when I communicate with other Indonesian friends from Jakarta or other areas of Java in Japan, I use colloquial Indonesian like Jakarta Indonesian, but I will never do that, never speak Jakarta Indonesian in Makassar. If I do that, friends of mine there will complain by asking me like, who are you? Where are you from? Their comment supports the hypothesis that the speakers of Makassar Indonesian use the pronominal critics of Makassari's origin to demonstrate their identity. Makassaris use the pronominal critics heavily to demonstrate their identity as Makassaris, that it's the most dominant ethnic group of the region. Bukinese people, another ethnic group of the region, use the pronominal critics to demonstrate that they are insiders of the South Slavish society. Based on their comments, we could say that the people in Makassar intentionally choose how heavily they use Makassar features in their utterance based on the status or language background of the addressee. Similar observations are reported about other non-standard varieties in Indonesia, such as Kupa Malay, as discussed in Ellington 2013. So let me conclude this presentation. In this presentation, we have shown sociolinguistic situation in Indonesia with a special focus on regional varieties of Indonesian and Malay. Samples of each variety form a semi-parallel corpus show the grammatical differences among them explicitly. In addition to established varieties, new urban varieties are emerging recently. One such case is Makassar Indonesian. The observation of Makassar Indonesian shows that the speakers use the regional variety to demonstrate their local identity. In the introductory part of the presentation, we have shown the sociolinguistic hierarchies formed by standard Indonesian and regional varieties. After we have seen the function of Makassar Indonesian, we could see the situation is not as simple as shown there. It's true that standard Indonesian is a prestige variety and regional varieties in general are considered to be less prestigious varieties, but the situation is not a simple binary opposition like that. As we have seen, regional lingua franca varieties have a function to demonstrate their local identity and show their solidarity among the indigenous ethnic groups. In the recent social change, 
in which the indigenous languages are declining, the regional lingua franca Malay varieties may compensate the function of the indigenous language once played. That's it for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanti and Asako. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, great to see again, especially that Makasau data. It's very interesting to see what they're doing and, and also their own reflections on uh, why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, so if anyone has uh, questions you want to use the last uh, 15 minutes or so to discuss, please do write those into the chat. Uh, there's a couple of questions that already come in. And uh, these are really about the, the scope of your study and perspective on how other sometimes been called uh, Malay Creoles fit into uh, your picture of Malay varieties. So the first question is, uh, where do varieties like Papua Malay or Monado Malay fit in, given that they are not mutually intelligible with other varieties? Are these varieties of one language? So how do uh, Papua Malay and Manado Malay fit into your view of variation in, in Malay and Indonesian? Okay. How do you, how will you answer, Yanti? <laughs> it's a tough question. We haven't really seen uh, data from Papua, but I guess uh, it's um, more into the, um, what's that, the vernacular, wait, wait a minute, let me check the slide again. Um, So, uh, I think they are still considered as, uh, they are also um, the regional lingua franca in a sense that they are used by people from different backgrounds in the area. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. So functionally, they still have that same regional function that you're looking at. You're not necessarily looking at how closely genetically related these varieties are, or if they're all necessarily mutually intelligible. More of their social function. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. Intelligible with other varieties. So, uh, Peter, do you mean, uh, you mean uh, speaker of Papua Malay cannot communicate with the speaker of Manado Malay? And is it still lingua franca? Is that your question? I can uh, try to unmute Peter if he wants um, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, firstly, thank you both very much for the presentation. I, I, I found it really interesting and it was nice to learn about the ongoing research. Um, my question is more a deeper philosophical one, which is you seem to be treating all of this as Malay and then saying, well, we can subcategorize that into different types of Malay. Um, but you know the the issue to me is well where do you draw the line and how do you know that something is Malay and something is not Malay? So um, if we said you know uh, somebody who only spoke Indonesia Malay and was confronted with Javanese would probably not understand it, therefore they're separate languages. But from what I, my understanding is that if uh, if you have someone who speaks Papuan Malay and um, they speak their variety, then um, someone else from Kupang or from Manado or Jakarta would have a really hard time understanding, Probably, possibly even to the extent um, 
of, of not, you know, at being as different as Javanese. So my question is really, how do you, how do you draw this distinction between language and dialect or variety? Um, it's a very old question and it's one, you know, that many people struggle with. Yeah, frankly speaking, I haven't thought about these philosophical questions deeper. Uh, the classification we made here is basically a historical one. So, yeah, I like to think about that issue later. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, and so the next question there was um, a similar one asking also about where Batawi Malay fits into this picture as well. So I, I suppose your answer would be similar, that uh, you haven't thought too much about distinguishing the, right. between Batawi Malay and the others. And I know there's debates about what is a Creole and what is a dialect or an emerging variety and all these questions as well. Uh, there's a question on another topic. Um, on the use of uh, this particle P, the one derived from Pergi in Kupang Malay and other varieties. The question is, did this uh, grammaticalization evolve separately or is there a common origin and perhaps some contact, uh, shared contact? So specifically you showed the P in uh, Kupang Malay, I think, and also in Makassar, Indonesian. Yeah, I will answer to the question. Yeah. I don't have any evidence about that, but we can guess that uh, P used in Makassar, Indonesia, has the same origin of the Eastern tradition, Eastern lingua franca Malay, like Kupa Malay. Um, because Makassar is located in, rather, located in the Eastern part of Indonesia, and it is reasonable to consider it as an influence of the lingua franca varieties. Okay, so there may be some influence there. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the semantics of that, if I can interject my own question. Uh, you normally translated that as uh, some kind of concurrent motion, so they went doing something, uh, so the, the action of moving was happening at the same time as the action or, what, or the activity of the verb. I wonder if, that, uh, if there's not also context where you might translate that as a prior motion. So they went and did something or they went before doing something or went in order to do something even. Have you looked specifically at the semantics of this and how it functions in, in discourse and its use or um, is that not something you've looked at yet? We haven't looked into that very much. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So another question about the, the source of change in these uh, emerging varieties. Let's try to read this question. Uh, we have seen that there are new emerging varieties from Makassar, or it's influenced by a relatively distinct regional language. But certainly some Malay vernacular varieties and established regional lingua franca are undergoing changes with influence from both standard Indonesian and Jakarta colloquial Indonesian. Are there new varieties emerging from these changes too? So not just influence from the substrate, from the local language, but influence from the standard or the colloquial Jakarta Indonesian, are you seeing that influence in emerging varieties also? Yes, the similar changes are ongoing in several large cities in Indonesia. For example, Michael Ewing is dealing with a new emerging variety spoken in, in Sunda area, in Bandung. Yeah, so there are some emerging varieties uh, reported, but not to a greater extent as we have, we can see in Makassar. So in, for example, in Bandung, Indonesia, only discourse markers of 
Sundanese origin uh, used in the variety. So maybe Makassar Indonesian behaves uh, exhibit uh, exceptional behavior in that it incorporates the pronominal critics in their grammars. Thank you. Do, do you also see these regional varieties adopting features from colloquial Jakarta Indonesian into the way they're speaking now? Is that, that kind of influence also happening? Oh, uh, yeah. How do you think, Yanti? Well, as far as I can recall from the data uh, we recorded and looked at, I did not yet uh, notice like a strong influence from the more like a prestigious mm. colloquial variety like Jakarta Indonesian. Okay, so much more local influence on the emerging varieties right. versus yeah. shifting towards a more uh, homogenous right. standard. But we'll, but this is a good point. We'll try to take a closer look and maybe, you know, and then uh, see if that is really the case. Okay, and there's another question from Peter, a long one. Peter, can I maybe unmute you again and let you ask your question? Okay, so okay. do you want me to ask the question rather than you read it out? Yeah, go ahead. If you don't mind. <laughs> um, I guess my, my question was, um, most um, most sociolinguistic studies where people have looked particularly looking at urban um, variation um, it's a matter of frequency um, the use of particular features um, linguistic features and so on um, they vary according to a frequency pattern so you have pointed out for example you have the mun uh, transitive uh, active marker and you showed us there are varieties that um, have it. There are some that do not have it. But um, if, we, um, if we look at from the perspective of sociolinguistics, what we might expect is frequencies rather than presence or absence. Um, so, you know, there might be situations in which people use MUN 60% of the time or 70% of the time. And my, um, so the two kind of cross-cutting dimensions that uh, sociolinguists have typically found, you know, going back to Laval 50 years ago, um, is um, social factors. For example, what you identified as um, intergroup, in-group communication, um, you know, people expressing their identity of belonging to a particular group. So that's the social dimension. And there's also the stylistic dimension. So typically when we pay more attention to our language, we use more um, prestigious, more standard, more, you know, upper, uh, on, a, on a percentage basis, not absolute. Um, so I was just interested to, think, to ask if you were thinking about looking at it from a proportions or percentage factor, and whether you had compared across styles, so conversational style versus um, telling a picture story style versus elicitation style versus, you know, checking people, how do you pronounce exactly this word? So the two cross-cutting dimensions of social dimension and uh, stylistic dimension um, looked at from a proportional point of view, not a plus or minus way that you seem to be presenting it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Peter. So, um, yeah, we, at, until this moment, we, our corpus only contains the data from the picture set. We haven't uh, had a chance, we haven't really uh, collected other types of uh, data, but um, we agree that um, you know social contexts seem to um, influence the types of speech or style that they provide. 
um, maybe I should share a little bit of our data in Makassar. We actually also, uh, so we collected data also, uh, from like this setting of data collection when we collected our data in Makassar uh, were kind of different. We have two different settings. One is at the university setting and the other one is outside the university. Um, seems like our speakers who are, so of course with their social status, they are lecturers, they tend to use uh, more of this standardized uh, lang uh, uh, language or variety when they were told to tell the stories. Um, the respondents who, are, who we recorded outside the university, um, they, were more aware, it's not more aware, but they, they maybe because of the context, they actually use like the, the variety which, which we think that that's the, uh, not like sort of like real, the day-to-day -day or Bahasa Sahari Hari that they use in Makassar. Um, but that's, a, in, yeah, I think it's a good point to see, um, like the occurrence, not just the presence or absence, but also to see how much, and there are different factors that um, affect, you know, how one speaker choose which variety they use in uh, their speech. I don't know, maybe Asako wanna add? No, <laughs> I don't have anything to add, thank you. Um, our last question then is is along the, the same lines. And so while Peter was pointing out the social context and you've taken that into account, also some questions about how the more individual socioeconomic variables might influence how a person speaks. Um, so one question, um, uh, just pointing out that some of your respondents have several different varieties in the repertoires, I think as we expect probably all of them do. I wonder how common this is, and is there a relationship with the level of education? So did you look at educational backgrounds of your respondents? Then there was another question on Facebook asking whether you looked at uh, the correlation with gender. So are you tracking these specific sort of individual socioeconomic characteristics? And will you look at how these things affect how likely a person is to use certain emerging features in their speech? Yeah, because of the nature of the task, it required some some kind of higher education level. So it is not very easy for everyone to see the picture and narrate it in standard Indonesian and colloquial Indonesian. So we have to admit that uh, our data in Makassar Indonesian and other varieties are limited. Uh, so the consultants are relatively of higher educational level. But yeah, we have to see as a more <laughs> utterances in casual conversation of ordinary peoples. I'd like to do that in the further study. That's great. You wanna add anything, Yanti? Oh, I think, yeah, that's... <laughs> Great. Well, uh, we reached the end of our hour. We don't have any uh, questions waiting, so maybe we'll just end there. Say uh, thank you again to Yanti and Masako for your time, participation, sharing your, your ongoing research. Uh, yeah, exciting to see what you're doing, and we look forward to your, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever comes of this research, the, the many publications that I'm sure will come from your ongoing research. So thank you for sharing with us today. You're welcome. Uh,